So this is our spring kind of campaign. The guys, if it weren't for Corona, the guys would be here in person, but they're here uh, virtually with us. This week, we have several, I'll, I'll mention them at the end. We have several different events this week you can participate in. So what is our topic, anxiety? Uh, uh, or Tiescoba is a good word for it in creation. Um, it's kind of strange. We live in a world that physically, I think is much safer than previous generations, um, but it's full of some kind of insecurity, or I think the, those, there's a word that's become popular in English called overload. We're just overloaded all of the time, um, uh, or we feel anxious. Um, so what is anxiety? Uh, anxiety is a tangle of emotions that comes up for us right before we are straight out afraid. So sometimes we feel afraid and we know, okay, in this moment I feel afraid, but we're more, more likely to spend a lot of our time feeling probably anxious about things. We feel kind of something less than fear. Um, and this can happen say, when you, um, uh, um, when you hear that someone's child is sick in a group, um, you may have a, a sense of fear, but very often we actually have a state of some kind of anxiety. We start to think about, well, what would it be like if my child was sick as well? Um, or there are people who just when they enter the room, oops, yields it back in. There are people that when they just enter the room, sometimes they seem to raise the anxiety in the room itself. And once this spreads in a group, um, it tends to, uh, um, influences the how the group functions and it often goes unseen so i wanted to ask ron and steve who i didn't introduce as fully as i should have steve had a long and very uh, uh wonderful career at procter and gamble um and ron uh had a very long and productive career at ford motor company um and they'll be both speaking a lot more about their stories the next couple of days in our other seminars um but i wanted to ask each of them ron can you share a time when anxiety you felt very anxious? Then don't share the how it got resolved yet. Just the just the beginning of the anxiety, kind of where it came from. Sure. <clears throat> well, just a it's it's more of a and you'll we'll talk about this later a double bind slash paradox story. Uh, in 2012, I was asked to move to China to lead uh, an organization as a director of a new powertrain division. And I was given this position by the Ford Motor Company. But this, to set the story up, but when I get there, and I knew this going in, but I didn't really understand everything completely. Um, I had this big role, um, create a brand new factory, a Greenfield site, uh, spend a billion dollars, hire 1,500 people, and had the place up and running in 18 months. Um, no small task. But but I'm the director, so it's it's good. We, you know, things get difficult. I can direct. When I get there, I find out well, or I understand. I did, I knew, but I didn't I didn't really understand it well. It's a 50-50 joint venture with another company, so I might have a title of director, but everything's negotiated. There was no decision allowed to be made at all without a complete agreement from the other company. And there was three companies involved. The Ford Motor Company had 50% ownership. Chang'an had 50% ownership, and then the joint venture, we called it, which was the result, and they had a lot of employees that were joint venture employees. So, so we're all coming together to go forward, but I was given the responsibility to move the organization, but quickly found out I had no authority once I was there. That could lead to a lot of sleepless nights. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Steve, what's a, what's a time that ang you felt anxious? Well, I um, uh, early in my career, I, I worked in engineering and I had done a lot of startups with production plants and I was pretty good at it. And, and one of the things that uh, I campaigned for a job to start up a production plant in Japan, which I got. And so I went to Japan and had a great assignment. I was a high, it was, it was successful. We produced, we had great results and uh, I wanted to stay, but company said, you're done with your task. You need to come back. It's too expensive to keep you there. So I thought when I came back because of such great success that I would come back to pick any assignment I wanted, it was going to be great. But when I came back, there weren't any assignments. I didn't have anything to do. 
at the exact same time they had appointed a vice president over engineering, he wanted to reduce the number of engineers and they started identifying people they were gonna let go. And here I am having gone from a high of the best assignment ever to the fear for my job mode. I was afraid, I was exposed, I had a big target on my chest, I didn't have anything to do. And then when they found me something to do, I didn't understand what they wanted me to do. And I was sweating it so bad that I actually went into depression over it. Because I was eight and a half years with a company, I had three children, and I thought, I'm going to get let go. That was major anxiety. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's anxiety mixed with outright fear. Wow. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, a recent time I became, I know that anxiety got really high in my life was when um, uh, our, our dear friend and and a guy who part of the reason a lot of us are here together, Drajan Galavash passed away suddenly. Um, there were tons of questions about how to care for his family and also then what what should continue. So I made a kind of emotional, quick um, decision response that said, I, I will take responsibility for leading the Global Leadership Summit in Croatia. And I had no idea what I had just said yes to. And it took a year or two of doing it before I had any idea what I had really said yes to. And so it was it was one of those things that, that was, um, there's a lot of anxiety of just feeling like, I don't really know exactly if people are gonna like me doing this. And, um, but I, there was no one else uh, standing up to volunteer for it. So yeah, those are some great, uh, and, and you probably all can, e we can all easily think of times in our lives where something drove anxiety in us. So, uh, and I only have like four slides here today. So, and then the, the, the my intention is to get through this so that we can really start talking as a group. So there's this thing, it's called family systems theory. And um, uh, there it is my notes um uh it was invented by a guy a really interesting uh guy named murray bowen who lived in the 20th century he was uh a researcher at the national institute of mental health in the united states and he was a pioneer of kind of changing the approach to how you do therapy traditionally therapy was something where somebody in a group in a family was brought in because they were messed up because they had problems because they were identified as a patient with a mental problem and the foot and the therapy that would be done for them was very focused on them as an individual. Murray Bowen had this insight where he said, you know what, I think sometimes when people come and they're presented as the patient, they're actually just the symptom of a larger system of how a family functions. And it's often that the but maybe the person who seems they're the most sick in the family is the one who's kind of trying the hardest to figure out how to to fix something or to even try to get out of it. Um, and so he developed a whole system around looking at families at systems and doing therapy with families as a whole. And these are some really basic ideas from it. It's a huge subject, but it's also can be kind of summarized. Basically, he says that families become systems. Every family is its own system and systems tend to become anxious over time because people are trying to figure out how to live with one another. And you kind of make some compromises. You kind of say, well, I'll go along to get along, but I don't really like it. And that tends to create anxiety. And this anxiety tends to get a hold over the system as a whole. So there tends to be these like, this like spider web of these anxious ways of behaving that, that happen inside of a system or inside of families. But this anxiety, it can be challenged. It can be transformed by anyone who is willing to change. Um, and this has been found to be a very useful set of ideas in government, in companies, in churches, and not just not just for family therapy itself. And another one of his ideas is very powerful, or maybe that other people have adapted, is to realize, oh, so the system of however your family worked when you were growing up probably has a lot to do with the way that you lead as an adult, that we tend to take the, the, these very early patterns we got in life and we behave in teams and even as leaders in ways that have a lot to do um, with how we grew up. Um, so Steve and Ron, again, I, I'm gonna put my, put my friends on the, on the spot. The rest of you can think about these same questions on whether it's something you would like to share later, but I'm, I'm going to, to um, boldly go after my friends first. <laughs> 
Steve and Ron, the question for each of you is, can you give an example of something that from your family background that has been a benefit to you in your leadership and maybe something that's been a disadvantage that comes out of your family of origin? So see, I asked Ron first last time. So Steve, can you think of something, what's an advantage you take from your family system of origin in leadership? Um, well, first, let me explain my my dad. Um, my dad was raised during the Depression of the 1930s and then very poor. Then he went through World War II and he fought in Asia for the Japanese. He came home, got married, didn't get a college education, went to a job that he didn't like. Well, my sister is older than me and then me. Uh, my dad, based on his family background and his history, he felt deprived of a lot of things. And so he wanted to deprive me too. He felt like I needed to suffer what he suffered. Wow. And, wow. and his personality was one that he could not give affirmation, none. All I ever got was negative. And so as I grew up, I had this feeling of a lack of, of care and affirmation. And so what that built in me was a need for that. Where can I get it? How do I, how do I, how do I overcome this? The, the, the crazy thing is the positive outcome of that was it caused me to overachieve. It caused me to pick the hardest route, electrical engineering, the bet, the most math I could, and I was a state competitor in the U.S. for math. Caused me to, you know, to to try to succeed, to overcome this deficit. And actually trying to prove to my dad that I had value. Wow. And and so the the negative caused me to do that. But through my whole career, I've had to deal with the issue, the problem of never feeling like I was good enough. So therefore I have to compensate and be yeah. better in order to prove to my dad and to myself that I was worthy. And so now my dad has some other good qualities, some principles that I live by. I mean, he was a believer and I trusted, he trusted God. It's just that he didn't know how to translate that into a loving, affirming relationship with me. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, that's, I mean, but the, uh, I, what I so admire about you being able to say that many people get, can never get to a point in life where they could tell that kind of a story that, that quickly to say, hey, you know, I sorted this. This is, there's a lot of good here and there's some other things I've, I realize what an effect this has on my life. And um, so, yeah, wow, I really appreciate you being willing to share that. Ron, what did, what's something good, good and bad you got from your family of origin? Okay. Well, you know, it's a bit of an opposite story of Steve in terms of um, the father relationship. Um, the, the good side was my dad always told me that I was a superstar told me I could do anything. All you had to do was get more education and work hard. And he was a very hard worker and he, and he demonstrated extremely good work ethics. So I followed that lead and believed I could do anything. And <clears throat> problem is when you believe you can do anything, sometimes you step out on a limb a little too far and it breaks. And, <laughs> and then you realize that uh, you, you really, you're really not Superman. Um, but, I, but I, overall, I think it was very, very positive because it, it, it drove me to be in a life of an adventurer and going forward and saying, hey, yeah, we can go do this thing. Or, and I would chase the hardest problems I could find because, A, I'm an engineer, and B, I can do anything. Um, but, but from a pride perspective, it's probably not that good because then you start thinking you're better than you really are. Uh, so there, there tends to be some neg negativity there um, on, the, on, the, on the downside of that discussion. Um, probably the biggest and most hurtful part of growing up, um, and this is difficult to say, my dad was an alcoholic. Um, so that, that caused a lot of other problems. And, and it literally, and what I saw was a guy that was a bit distant from us in a lot of, a lot of ways, a uh, big cheerleader, but, but not a lot of, you know, on the hands coaching that I think we needed. And, and also it drained the, the family finances um, for a good bit and um, made me feel a little bit like I didn't measure up to the rest of the kids in school because the house was not taken care of. It was the smallest house on the block wow. and wow. some different things like that, 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 
So there was, I mean, and I hate to talk about that because it's a bit painful. Um, but at the end of the day, I got a, a bit of strength from that. Um, that. That became, you know, hey, we're going to work our way out of this. I'm going to learn to do things differently. You know, in fact, you know, I, I, I don't drink because you know, I'm, I'm afraid of it. <laughs> so, but it hasn't hurt me. <laughs> it hasn't hurt me at all to not. So, uh, um, and, and, I, and, 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 and I just drove to try to do things better uh, from a family perspective, uh, making sure that my my kids had a, you know uh, somebody there with them, talking to them, a, a nice home that they could they could be happy to walk into and say this place is well taken care of, and and uh, so so I think I was able to um, through through God's grace see that this was a, a learning experience um, to go go hey what, what went really well and what 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 can I improve on as I move forward and, and have that position. Uh, position or not, I wouldn't say the word position is not the right word, but, but be a father and, and, and take that leadership role on correctly. Wow. Yeah, that that's also uh, very, um, um, thank you for sharing that, uh, the, the truth of that. Um, I, uh, for myself, I'd say, um, like my, <laughs> my father worked on the safety systems for nuclear power plants. So the whole thing I grew up with was like, be responsible, um, make sure you check everything off. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, don't don't take a really risky approach to things. Um, so I, I have a lot of. It's easy for me to be cautious and thorough in many situations. Um, but the the other another side of that is that it's um, I I struggle to take risks a lot. And then my wife kind of laughs at me and she says, "Well, you married me and moved to Croatia, so." It must not be that awful for you, but it's it's. I feel anxious a lot when I'm taking risks or when I'm trying new things. It's something that's hard for me to to step out into in a lot of ways. So yeah, so I mean, I, for all of us thinking through our families, where we come from, and then maybe how that is um, playing out in the way we lead is a great investment of of time and of thought and reflection. So thank you guys for sharing that again. So let's talk about, now this is a, let's talk about, okay, what, what does this really look like? What are some real sources of leadership anxiety? Um, and uh, uh, there's many of these, and I picked three of them that I think are kind of easy to understand and, and quite frequent in organizations here. So they, then we have these little names for them, so I'll explain each one. The first one is called a triangle. And a triangle is anytime there are three people in a conversation where there should be two people. Basically, in life and relationships, it really should be conversations between two people. You know, you have a problem with someone, you should go talk to them. But actually, we don't like to do that. We find it difficult to be in a direct one on one relationship with a person. We would rather go and gossip with somebody else or complain about our relationship with someone to a third person and, and look for strength or sympathy or advice from somebody else. And when we do that, we create a triangle, which is we bring a third person, or sometimes it can be a thing or a something else, but we, we pull something else in, in order to, um, to avoid probably what we should really be dealing with one-on-one -on -one with a person. If you notice, oftentimes, if you get together with someone and you know you should really be talking to them about a problem you have with them, you can spend the whole conversation talking about other people who are problems on the team and never get around to addressing the issue that you have directly with the person you're talking to because it's easier to make peace by pulling in a third party. So a triangle is this situation again, where there's three people or three things in a conversation where there really should be two. And oftentimes as leaders, we get triangled into other people's problems, which is that your people that work for you may come to you and say, I am having a terrible time with this other colleague. And depending on how you tend to function as a person, um, you either may reject getting into that at all, or you may tend to then insert yourself into other people's relational problems. You may tend to enjoy being triangled into a bad relationship between two other colleagues. And you might be a good question to ask yourself is, do you tend to more run away from things like that? Or do you tend to be kind of pulled in? Um, do you find it like, oh, I, I get to now, you know, be important here. Um, uh, by being a part of this conversation. So that, that's emotional triangles. Um, uh, a double bind is the second example I have here. A double bind is no matter which option you choose, you lose. 
you have been sort of set up to fail. Um, I think I see a lot of this here in Croatia, partially, again, because our relationships with other people tend to often be very, very deep. And there's a lot of um, deep friendships where also there's maybe a whole history of like doing favors um, for people where, where you, you have both um, uh, done something for somebody else and they've done things for you at times. And so it can become extremely difficult if it, you ever get into a situation where like, I should have a difficult conversation with this person. I should confront them about something they're doing. But in some part of you, especially if you're from a more, maybe more rural part of Croatia, potentially is going to say like, no, they did, they, they did so much for us. That person has been, has helped my family in times that were bad or situations that were challenging. I cannot um, uh, 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 change this. I cannot criticize them. But you're in a double bind because you know that the situation is bad. And if you don't do something about it, it's just going to get worse. Or you might have other people are coming to you and saying, you really need to go talk to them. And you're going to lose face with the one group of people. But you also feel like if you address the issue, you're going to lose a relationship. So you feel like there's no way out. Um, you feel like no matter which way you turn, you lose. So this is when this again, the idea is this makes us anxious when we feel this way. And the third one, simple one, is the way they talk about it in some of its literature is they call something a phantom strike. And the phantom strike is when someone comes to you and says, I and a whole bunch of people who would rather be anonymous have a real problem with the way you're leading. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, I have a whole army behind me that agrees with me that you're doing it wrong, but they're too afraid to say it. So you just need to trust me that I am speaking on behalf of a large group of people. And, and that's really crazy because uh, uh, you have to trust this person or decide whether you believe this person who's bringing this to you. And you're, again, going to become anxious because you actually can't, they're insisting that, that you can't talk to the people behind them because they're, they're too afraid to talk to you or something like that. So again, a triangle is conversations with two people in them that should have, with three people in them that should have two people. A double bind is where you feel like you lose no matter which path you choose. And a phantom strike is uh, a person criticizes you and claims to have an uh, anonymous group and agreement behind them. And there is actually in the literature around this, they'll list nine, 10, 12 sources of this kind of anxiety. There's many more of them, but I picked three because I thought they're pretty accessible ideas. So Steve, Ron, can you guys think of quick examples of something, one of the three of these? Yeah, I, I can talk about, about triangles. I think I talked about double bind a few minutes ago, but, but yeah. triangles are pretty common in business, I think. Um, for example, especially if you have a, several people on the team that, that might re, may report to you. And, and I'll remember, remember a time, and I'll, I'll just give one, because I could probably give 10. Uh, so, so Kathy comes to me and she says, you know, I, I can't work with Dominic. Dominic, is always driving too hard. He's trying to go too fast. Doesn't pay attention to the details, and the team gets confused. We can't go forward. And then, and then Dominic comes and says, "Hey, you know, I can't work with Kathy. She's too detailed. She <laughs> wants to understand 100% of the information before we can go forward, and it's slow. And and and, and it keeps us we're too slow. Now, well, two professionals come to me and say, "Hey, look, I can't get along with the other professional, but they don't talk to each other about it." That's to me, that's the triangle that doesn't work. Um, typically my solution for that is I give them a, a third assignment that's way out of the box, <laughs> an assignment that they've never done before. For example, in this case, I, I said, you know, we're, we've got some students coming in to work for the summer. I'd like for you two to work together to put together a program to, to introduce our company, give them meaningful assignments, and also teach them and show them how we are a collaborative group. We all work well together. Um, let me know when you get the program done. That's great. We'll come back to yeah. We'll come back to the solution. So you yeah okay. you gave your solution. No, that that's fantastic. So like remind me if I don't mention how that how some some of the ways that plays into solutions. Steve, what's a um, what was a time that what's one of these you can identify with? I had a phantom strike uh, on my way to Japan in my move. I had to go to California for two weeks to to work in a production plant with the team of Japanese who were there temporarily to learn the production system so they could go back to Japan to run it. And one of their managers was a Japanese American who actually was from Cincinnati, same as me, who I knew. And when I arrived in that plant, California, 
one of the first things he said to me was, everybody here is angry with you. <laughs> this is the, these are the people I'm gonna be leading to start the plan up. And he said, everyone here is angry with you. That was the statement. Wow, yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah, I've <laughs> often, <laughs> I was laughing because I was thinking of the number of times that people have told me, um, and I and I really oftentimes it's with good intention where they'll tell me, Nolan, like this is how you come across in Croatia, and it's really bad. And and they're they're not saying I feel this way as a Croat. They're like, no, 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 Croats think you are messed up like this or whatever. And sometimes they're right, but but you know that it's it's boy is that especially when you're new and you're in a new situation, you're in transition. And somebody, you you don't have a whole lot of your own data to go on, right, Steve? But but and this guy presumably has some sort of cultural insight if he's Japanese American and he he spoke for a group of people, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, I'll send your anxiety through the roof. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Especially when you're in the middle of a move. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you're just starting. Whew. Okay. Um, okay. So how to lead towards health? I've just given you lots of maybe hard news or um, bad news or whatever, but how do you, how do you try and start lead to help? And of course, this is the kind of thing I'll, I'll show you books at the end. You can, uh, and there's an excellent podcast. If you can listen in English, um, I can recommend to you on this topic. Um, but how do you start to try and, you know, lead, lead towards health? And one of the, the best uh, truths you've probably come across before, but it's always worth reminding is to just clarify for yourself that you cannot change anyone else. You can only change yourself. But but uh, the systems theory is a lot about the way that in as, in as powerful as everybody being stuck together can be, it's also very, very powerful when one person decides to start changing their approach to the rest of the group. You can't force anybody else to change, but you can be very, very influential in starting to get this network of relationships to start getting unstuck. Uh, like Steve and Ron both gave some examples, explore your own family of origins dynamics, uh, the story. There are some actual practical tools that some, I know we've used some in focus, uh, including something called a genogram, where you actually kind of draw a, di a diagram of the history of your own family that can often very much help us to understand why we tend to get very anxious in certain kinds of situations. Um, and also it shows us somewhere we have strength that we can draw on as well. This is the biggest concept. It's a tricky one in uh, the next one in systems theory is called work to become a non anxious presence in the team. You want so non anxious means you've decided I'm no longer going to add to all the anxiety in the group. I am not going to be the one who just kind of throws even more uh, uh, pressure into the room, but you want to be present. You do not want to to leave the group. You wanna figure out how do I be present with people uh, and yet not be anxious. And this would be in a situation like somebody comes to you and they're very upset and they wanna tell someone about how upset they are or how frustrated they are, and you are willing to listen to them. You're willing to give them maybe not an infinite amount of time, but you are patient, you're, you're a good listener, you're able to hear where they're really um, at, um, but also you then don't necessarily um, uh, decide to then absorb all of that frustration or anger or, or anxiety that the other person is feeling. You are able to listen, be helpful, process things, but then really, in a sense, give people their own challenges back to them and say, well, it sounds like the next thing you're gonna have to do is blah, 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 as opposed to, okay, this means I now have to go in and try and fix this because I'm supposed to fix this because you gave me all of your anxiety. So to be a non-anxious presence, to somehow be a person who is present, who is not running away yourself, but but is able to um, not react out of a lot of anxiety. Another uh, step you can take is, is name the dynamics with people. Um, uh, you can even explain these concepts to people you're in relationship with. You can say like, you know, I feel like I'm being pulled into a triangle here. The two of you really um, are um, having a difficult time with one another and and you're looking for me to provide the third leg and be the stability that kind of bridges between you. Um, and I, I don't think that that's gonna be helpful for either one of you. 
Um, uh, so if you can name dynamics with people, uh, many things in life, if they get named, they, they lose a lot of their power that they have when they were just unseen or unnoticed or in the darkness. Another one, especially for leaders, is to expect a lot of resistance uh, when, you, when you start changing. Even, that's a term used in this literature, even something called sabotage, which would just be that. Uh, it's very ironic. A lot of systems, a lot of teams are full of anxiety, but they don't want to change because change would mean even more anxiety. So people would, many people would stay in anxiety because the fear of fixing things, the, fe the fearful place that fixing things might push them to seems worse than where they are. Um, so so uh, leading change is not easy because it's really easy for people to resist the change. Um, and so then again, that calls on you as the leader, as the person who's decided you are, are now have a, you have your own stance, you are going to act a certain way you decide, okay, I am, I'm not going to give up. Um, but, but, and, and just knowing that like, you're not going to probably run into just, uh, um, a parade and everybody rejoicing that you have now, you're now helping them move forward, uh, is, is, um, it can be helpful. And the last thing is always remember this is a journey and not a destination. This is not about becoming a Zen monk or somebody who is uh, um, a Jedi who has no emotions, uh, who who always gets this right in every single situation. Um, uh, the, if you can set up an environment for yourself and for others where you say, I, I want us to grow and I want us to get better, um, that's one of the best things um, you can do. So. Um, let's, uh, the last slide of content I have here is just to go back to these and, and, uh, Ron, uh, uh, share, or Steve shared, heard, shared a little bit about it, but I'll go through this and then we can hear some examples too, about how you can sort of move towards, uh, fixing some of these situations. Again, it, it, when you feel triangled into something, look for how to get out of it. Um, uh, one of the ways triangles gets created triangles get created is through um, people saying, can I trust you with a secret? And you don't know what the secret is yet. So you say, yeah, okay. And then they drop some bomb on you. Like I'm having an affair and this is a friend and you're friends with both people and a spouse. Now, and both spouses and a couple. Now that puts you in an enormously terrible position that it's the kind of thing people lose sleep over, over and over again. But just because somebody said, can I share a secret with you and then share something like that with you does not mean that you should stay in that horrible position. And that's a situation in which you might wanna say something like, look, I cannot carry that. You have 24 hours to tell your spouse or I will. Um, uh, to get out of anxiety often means being willing to do things that may seem paradoxical or, or surprising or out of the ordinary. Um, if you're in a double bind, if you really feel like I can only go left or right, and either way it's going to be bad, um, this is a place where it's good to get advice. Ask other people, is there really only two choices here? Often there aren't. Um, see if there's a third way. Uh, and But if it, re if it really becomes clear that there are only two choices, then the victory in a double bind is to lose well and quickly and move on. Just to say, okay, there's no way out of this. Pick your poison let it happen and move on because you'll never, you'll never win. Right. So, um, and phantom strikes, uh, uh, this happens in churches a lot. I think that people say people are too afraid to come talk to you, but you're really leading terribly. Um, then it's, I think it's very appropriate to say you can either kind of bring us into all in the conversation and people can identify themselves or, or, or really put this all down on paper or I, we're not going to talk about it because this will, this will just drive everybody crazy. So those are some kind of the, you know, I hope these sound like give you some sort of a start, start to get an idea of how you can start to differentiate yourself to, um, to have that non-anxious presence to respond in such a way that you are, um, making it clear who you are and where where you stand, but you're still in relationship with other people. You still want to be in relationship with them. You you want to grow. You want them to grow. Um, it's not about hating people or becoming a, uh, a disconnected from them. It's about trying to help them grow. So, Steve, I don't know. Well, can you? How did you get? How did you resolve the? All the Japanese guys hate you. <laughs> <laughs> situation. Well, I uh, I met all the Japanese people and um, started meeting with some of them one on one, and I just 
brought it right up. It said, is there something you have a problem with with me? And to a person, they said, no, not really. And, and then what I came to learn is the guy who told me this was the only one that was angry because he wanted to be the startup leader. And he was bitter that I was assigned the leadership. And he told me a direct lie. And he was actively trying to sabotage me by turning everyone against me. Um, but what happened then, I started to develop relationships with all the other managers. And they began to see quickly that that was a lie that that he was able to live on, that that man was a liar, frankly. And I experienced that for the whole time I was in Japan. We were never able to resolve that relationship because he tried to undermine me the whole time. But I built solid relationships with everybody else. So the best way to manage him was to ignore him, although he had power, mm. but he ended up being not trusted by a lot of people because they saw how manipulative and deceitful he was. So it was a successful assignment in spite of him. Mm -hmm. What I like about your story is that you, um, you obviously, it was a, a that's an extremely anxiety provoking situation and you continued, but you, you moved forward towards relationships with other people. You, you, you branched out, you, you, you know, because some people could go into a shell and think, oh, they, I guess they all do hate me. And so I'll have to lead from a distance or something. So you, this is, I think exactly what this kind of material is about is that you pursued relationships in the face of what could be paralyzing anxiety. And you eventually began to understand, aha, there's something else going on here. And this happens over and over that when people say, I, me and a whole group of people are really disagree with you is often covering for, um, uh, yeah, for something that's going on inside of one person, basically. So thank you. That's a great example. Um, Ron, what, what's a, how did, uh, uh, <laughs> how did you move forward? So Ron is going to talk about negotiation tomorrow at our seminar tomorrow, which is public. So if you, uh, if you haven't registered for that, I can still squeeze you in somehow. So uh, I think Ron's going to talk a lot about um, this joint business venture, but um, how'd you deal with some of those double blinds? Yeah, <clears throat> let me. Yes, it was quite interesting. Um, first, I had to change my whole way of thinking in terms of leadership. On, on the Western side of the business at Ford, when you walk into an organization and you're responsible for X, uh, you usually have the, um, you have the obligation to, to move people in a direction that just makes sense and do well. But if, it, if, there, if there's a difficulty, you always have the positional power to say, thou shalt do this because timing says you can't wait. Um, but I couldn't do that. It was really a, a bind in my, and it called, I did lose a lot of sleep at first because, um, you know, you could have an, uh, an opportunity to build a factory and create a launch and support the organization with a product. But the day you have to support the organization with a product, you have to support the organization with a product. You must manufacture on this date and it must be at a rate that is acceptable to the customer or you, in the Ford world, you would be fired. Wow. You just don't not support a vehicle program. If they want an engine on in six months from today and they want a hundred engines an hour, you better support them or you will no longer have a position in the company. Uh, so it was a do or die. But then when I get there, I, I can't make decisions without a lot of conversation. And so uh, the, the really the good news was I had to, to and this is how I, I I'm not going to talk a whole lot about negotiations, but boy, I got a lot better at it. Mm -hmm. and there's a bright side to leading. <clears throat> that you'd have no authority to lead or no positional power to lead. Mm -hmm. it, it's, you now focus your whole process and thinking is how do I get people to agree with the direction? How do I get buy-in? It always, it comes down to a, a real desire and a, and a strategy to get everybody to buy into the way forward. And, and, and I think kind of that's the way it is with pastors of large churches. You got a whole yeah. congregation that you're trying to teach something or move in a direction, but you have zero authority. Um, you're teaching, you're, you're hoping that the crew is going to go. No one's getting paid that you got a thousand people in the congregation and you're trying to teach them that, Hey, we need to go have a building program because, 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 
because has to be really good because they're not going to follow unless unless they really agree with the direction. So I think it was a huge, in my mind, change of my leadership style um, to a, a good leadership style where, where we talked a lot, we conversed a lot, we we aligned ourselves in direction and, and grew in relationships. Um, and it was a deep respect for the culture um, mm. that, that in, in China, um, negotiations and, and alignment are very, very important. And they, they believe everybody has to be 100% aligned with the direction. And so the, to take, I'll say, take the wheels out from under me, and the platform out from under me and saying, now you still have, you're still responsible to, to bring this organization to the, to the finish line, but yet you have to do a, a whole different way of thinking. And mm -hmm. so uh, it was, to me, it turned out a double bind, but it was a huge growth process for me personally. Wow, thank you. And I, I think that's a, what I really appreciate about your story, as it comes to mind for me at least, is the idea that you you didn't lose, like in a sense, you didn't lose yourself. You you knew I'm a Ford guy and this is how we do stuff in Ford. And 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 I know what the expectations are and, and I'm employed by Ford and this, this is where I'm coming from. But you were willing to jump way into the Chinese part of the situation and not be stuck and say, okay, let's, let's figure out how things really work here, how people really relate. This is a, this is a different reality. And, and your success seems seemingly to me would be, I've heard, you know, a story multiple times is that you were able to bridge those two worlds. And that's often what <clears throat> people are talking about in this concept of how to become a, a non-anxious presence is that you, you don't just completely go all the way to just completely identifying with other people you you have a you know who you are and where you're coming from but you can move towards other people you are able to be in relationship and and yet keep a track of your higher purpose um and so i think you in in there basically are some really great examples of that so and come back tomorrow if you want to hear a little more about that um so thank you thank you so my last slide is uh, some suggestions. And then once I, once I do this part, um, we'll, we'll turn off the recording and we can spend the rest of the time having, having a you know, more open discussion. Um, but how are some ways, some are some ways you could put this into practice immediately. Um, one is for you to just think like, what is a significant source of relational anxiety for you right now? And I don't think that's probably very hard for any of us to do, um, but to think and say, using some of the stuff we talked about this evening and to ask yourself, so how did this thing get stuck? Because if it's really, if it's an enduring source of relational anxiety for you, it's probably that way because it's stuck somehow. And it got stuck somewhere along the way due to some sort of forces. And the time is to think like, well, what, what could you do to help create change? And it might be going ahead and doing some things that would be surprising or out of character for you. Oftentimes we, we get really stuck because we just keep trying harder because in our family of origin, it was always important that we, you know, always keep working hard, no matter what anybody says. And, and sometimes um, change happens in us being willing to try a new way of doing things. Um, I have a similar question, but it might be a little bit different is who is the person in your life right now? Who is the greatest source of anxiety? And then a question to ask about this, I hope it makes sense is like, are you moving towards or away from this person? Like, did they make you anxious so you run away from them? Or do they make you anxious so you keep going and moving more and more towards them? We often do this with children. We, we, they're, they're, they're not doing well. So we keep trying to move towards them. We keep trying harder and harder to, um, to get into their lives or to be understood with them. Um, and what about them? Is this other person trying to move towards you or trying to move away from you? And then kind of what is that doing to the relationship? If, or if you're both running away from each other, it's probably just over. But oftentimes what happens is that, that one person is running towards the relationship and another person is running away from it. And so it might help you to stop and think like, okay, how did, how, like, how's that happen? And where is that leading to things? Um, here's one to try. You could try tonight. Ask your family the following question. How do you know I'm not okay before I know I'm not okay? Like ask your kids, how do you know that that dad or mom is not had a good day before I say anything else? And this can be often very revealing um, uh, when, when we start to realize that other people see how we're doing a lot more than we think. We often have a better idea of like other people's 
tells how they reveal that they're stressed out or something than we of our own. Um, and a really risky question if you want to try is to ask your team, how does my presence in the room change the dynamic? What happens in the room when I enter? And what happens in the room when I'm not around? If you want to have a interesting, potentially very challenging conversation with your team, that's a question you can ask them. What is my presence really like? How do you guys experience me? Um, and you might find that uh, the answers you receive are, are, are quite surprising. Um, so yeah, uh, here are the um, sources. Um, uh, uh, Managing Leadership Anxiety by a guy named Steve Cuss is a wonderful book. He's a Christian pastor, um, but he, he really has thought about this in terms of organizations. Uh, and uh, you can look up his podcast, which is excellent. I, a lot of the material in here is from what I've gleaned from him. Uh, and there's an older book that's pretty was very influential called A Failure of Nerve Leadership in the Age of the Quick Fix, where a Jewish rabbi who lived in Washington, D.C., of all places, applied this to U.S. government problems and has just fascinating stories in his book. So uh, with that, uh, oh, yeah, and I'll just show these are our events the next th uh, the next three nights. So tomorrow, Ron will be talking about negotiation. Uh, and uh, you can send me an email for any of these if you don't have the registration links. On Wednesday, not so much in this direct program, but also with some of our other partners, we have a um, seminar uh, webinar on what we've learned in the year of the pandemic with a um, really interesting man from Florida who leads uh, has led a very large uh, community college there. And on Thursday, um, we are going to talk about prayer, prayer at work, prayer for work, prayer when you're at work, prayer for people you work with. Um, uh, Steve and Ron, as I've gotten to know them, both have really, really interesting experiences that I thought would be great for um, uh, for people to to hear more about. So with that, I'm going to stop my sharing. I'm going to turn off.